got another one of them popping at the mouth of Welcome to New Mexico Black Rifle Operators Union. I'm your host, Sean. So I have a couple things I wanted to cover. I'll keep it short tonight because it uh, doesn't seem like a lot of people have been listening lately, but I'm still going to keep trying because, well, I enjoy doing this. And, well, someone's got to keep talking about this stuff, especially in a New Mexico context. So we got two big wins that are kind of coming down the pipe. One was that our governor has been found in court that she can't get an injunction against, or a stay, I should say, against her unjust rule of banning the 2A in public places. So that means that they can't enforce this now. Uh, that's a big win for Bernalillo and Albuquerque specifically, but it also shows that there's still a lot of 2A support in New Mexico because, you know, we are the Southwest. We do know that we are our own first responders here. We have been, we've known that for a long time. Some of us like that idea because we like living in the Southwest and we know that it's rural and we want to keep it that way. We aren't California. We don't want it to be California. Um, our governor likes to push us that way, though. The second win is something that is coming out of the Eighth Circuit, and this has to do with the pistol brace rule. And what has been showing on multiple law channels that I follow just because of this type of stuff is it looks like the ATF is going to get another defeat in that they are probably going to put a national injunction back in place for everyone that has pistol braces, if you so have one. Now, I'm saying this because, well, this matters because it is something that shouldn't matter to anyone, but it seems to matter to the ATF specifically because they're trying to make a lot of people felons overnight. Um, but what I wanted to really talk about was something that kind of came to me out of the blue today, and I was looking, not really looking, mentally going through my gun collection. And why I was doing it is I was thinking about legacy firearms. Firearms that, what I mean by legacy, that they have value either to your family or they're inherently valuable because they are something that is rare. Okay? And why is that important? Every gun collector, every person in the 2A should have at least a few legacy items. And these are heirlooms that, you know, I have in my personal collection. I have about four guns that are family heirlooms, meaning that they came from my father or they were purchased by my father. If I include those, I have probably six to ten um, that I need to, to worry about that being a legacy item. But something that you want to keep in the family, you want to put in a will, and you want the people that get them to know that these can never leave the family. That means they can't ever be sold. Um, and if they ever get in a tight and they need to pawn them or something like that, because, you know, that's happened in my family, um, that they need to talk to someone else in the family before they do that. Maybe they can get a loan, a temporary loan or something. But the reason why you keep legacy firearms isn't just that. I mean, if you look at our deep history that we have of the 2A, you know, this is stuff you want to hand down. Just because a gun is old and maybe not in the best repair, um, maybe not be able to be used, doesn't mean it should be gotten rid of. It's not something that you just get rid of. You know, think about how many guns have been turned in after someone has passed away to a gun buyback. You know, I know of a couple STG-44s based on what I've read um, in New York and in Illinois that they were turned in. Now, these guns are rare be because there wasn't that many made to begin with, let alone make it to the United States. Um, these are part of our heritage as, you know, people. You know, it's, it's just like finding a, a stone carving uh, or, or a um, an arrowhead from our past. You know, this stuff is something that needs to be kept and held at least as a monument to the stuff that where we came from, where we're going, you know what I mean? And it, it made me think about more of the modern firearms I have. Which one of these would be legacy in the future? You know, if the government has its way, you know, these a lot of the modern firearms are going to be illegal to own in the future. 
And if you look at how they're writing the statutes, they're even making them to where you have to turn them in so that you cannot um, sell them or give them to your family. Um, they're not grandfathered in. And that raises a lot of concerns for me because one of the guns I have is an M1 Garand um, that my dad had. And I would like to leave it to one of my sons, if not my daughter, um, because... It is a piece of history, one, and two, it was my dad's. And why is that important to me? Or why am I worried about it? Because if they get to the point where they ban semi-automatics, you know, this is something that we need to think about, is the M1. It are things like that. M1 Grand doesn't seem like it would be banned, but what about the SKS? You know, the SKS is named in several of these bands because it is a scary gun. But if you look at the history of it, it's got a legacy about the same as an M1 Garand. Historically, precedently, it has one. So why would we ban such a weapon? You know, if we let the left continue to dictate what's going on, and I say the left, the anti-gunners, the people that want to disarm us... It looks more and more that it's coming from both sides to me, you know, being an ANCAP type person or an, uh, someone who's pretty much had enough of the government in our life. It looks more and more that people are trying to disarm us. Now, there's conspiracy minded person that I can be at times. If they disarm us, that makes us perfect subjects to be able to do whatever they want to us. And a lot of us won't side with that. I mean, that if we're that founded in the 2A and founded in our Constitution um, and our Bill of Rights specifically, and we've taken those lessons of our forefathers, we aren't going to give them up quietly. Okay. Now, that, that also leads that other conversation. It's can the government even, even if they ban them? I honestly think there's a lot of people in the United States that have pretty much given up listening to governments. And what I mean by that is after COVID, and I bring this up a lot in the podcast, and I'm, I apologize for you guys that, that are get tired of me speaking about the COVID stuff. I think there was a lot of people that just went about their life and didn't really care about what the government said. And there were no real repercussions from that for most of us. So why would we listen to them if we are not, you know, mur murdering, pillaging, and and raping and so forth, if we're not causing the ire of law enforcement anyway, why would we be, why would that draw attention to us? You know, unless you, you foresee an area or a time and a place that the government has enough resources to follow every man, woman, and child in the United States to where they go shooting, um, you know, I don't see them being able to enforce the, these laws that they keep trying to push down. You know, I, I think that what they're going to be, how it's going to be put down in the future, and how it's already being put down in major metropolitan areas, is if you're caught with a gun, whether you're supposed to have it or legally can have it or not, it doesn't matter. They're going to use it to uh, tie you up or hem you up in court. But for those of us more rural folks that live out in the, you know, the sticks or small cities, our law enforcement agents have other things to worry about. And that's not high on their radar unless you do something stupid like you shoot at a cop or you're actually shooting um, in a self-defense situation or something like that. Then they might step in and start trying to enforce laws one way or another, especially in Albuquerque. I could see them going after a law-abiding citizen defending themselves at the same time. There's been some of those cases in Albuquerque that um, they were ruled justifiable homicide and nothing ever happened to those people. I think we all can agree that whether you lawfully do use a, a gun in self-defense or not, you're going to probably spend one night in jail at the minimum. Um and I would hope that you have well, insurance that can help take care of that. And uh, when I say that, they can postpone, they can help you with legal fees, so on and so forth. Because these are things you need to think about in, the, in that self-defense realm. But back to the legacy firearms. 
I'm curious to see if those are the people that have listened to my podcast, what kind of legacy arms they have. You know, I've, I'm as I get closer and closer to being back to where I was financially, to where I can start participating and adding to my collection, I've thought about the one or two guns that I must have, and those are still going to be firmly out of my realm of uh, purchase for a while. But one of the guns I'd like to add is a Winchester Model 92 or 94, you know, or even a Marlin 336. Uh, 3030 is my preferred caliber. A 357 would be followed by that, and maybe a 44 Magnum or even a 45 Long Colt. But the idea there is this is something that is also legacy to me. You know, my Uncle Phil had a lot of Winchesters. He collected Winchester lever actions, pre 64s down from 2520 all the way up to 4570. So it would be kind of honoring some of my other legacy in my family. My Uncle Phil was a big uh, role in my life. He's a big pers- uh, big was a big collector of firearms, specifically cowboy guns and guns of the Wild West era. Um, he wasn't a cowboy action shooter, but he also collected World War II firearms. You know, these these are weapons that I could see being parts of pieces of uh, collections of my listeners that ha- that actually have some legacy pieces. I know one of my continued listeners has some lever guns that he got um, from his father, and their legacy heirlooms to him, even though he may not have kids in the future, but they'll be passed on to other members of his family, I believe. And that's awesome. Um, you know, I personally, most of my collection will go to my, my kids, but there are a few pieces that go to, to my friends, um, my close friends, the ones I've always had, uh, you know, from fourth grade on. Um, some of my newer friends that I, I say newer, I've known my newest friend that I would call my best friend, one of my best friends now. I've known him for probably 20 years on or off if not more, and I could see handing something down to him too, and my collection's large enough to do that. But I think about these legacy firearms, and and that's also part of what I, what's endearing to me about the two-way. So there's my thoughts on tonight. Some wins. Um, I think we have a long battle still going on, and this season, this year is going to be nuts because of the election. Um, how you vote, that's on you. I honestly think that it really doesn't matter in the presidential race. Pay attention to the down ticket uh, races that affect you locally. Those are going to matter in the future more than the presidential race. Um, I personally think that the presidential race this year, though, is going to show the country one way or another which direction it's going to go. And I think if we keep allowing the same um, president in office right now, to keep his job, and it's going to keep the regime he's part of in power, and that's a problem. Like, share, subscribe, most importantly, be great.